Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We want to welcome you to our webinar on the treatment of skull deformities in children. As you will see, this will include the diagnosis and treatment of all types of skull shapes and abnormalities, including deformational posterior plagiocephaly and craniosynostosis. We hope you enjoy the talk today and look forward to fielding questions from you, the audience, at the conclusion of the webinar. First, we'd like to introduce ourselves as the host for this talk today. I'm Matthew Greaves, and I'm a fellowship-trained craniofacial and pediatric plastic surgeon. Here at Children's Memorial Hermann, I specialize in the treatment of children with cleft and craniofacial anomalies, including craniosynostosis. I also help run both the cleft and the craniofacial team, as well as the new vascular anomalies team. Hi, I am Manish Shah. I'm a fellowship trained pediatric neurosurgeon specializing in the management of craniosynostosis along with pediatric spasticity and pediatric epilepsy surgery. Um, welcome to today's webinar. So we work out of Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital located in scenic Houston um, next to Memorial Hermann Park. Um, and we are in partnership with UT Health. Texas Houston. We're both part of a much larger team of providers who comprise the Texas Cleft and Craniofacial Team. Our team is composed not only of plastic surgeons and neurosurgeons such as ourselves, but also the ENT surgeons, oral maxillofacial surgery, uh, orthodontists, as well as speech and swallow therapists, nursing, and genetic counselors. And working with this multidisciplinary team of professionals gives our patients the comprehensive care that all of our patients deserve. So to get started, we have an outline of our talk for this webinar today. Our talk today will focus on an overview of all types of abnormal head shapes and the anatomy that underlies them. We'll then discuss a common cause of head shape changes called deformational posterior plagiocephaly and discuss the therapies for treating it, including helmet therapy. Following this, we will then discuss the causes and different types of craniosynostosis and the reasons that surgical treatment is necessary for these patients. We will then discuss the types of treatment for craniosynostosis that we offer here at Children's Memorial Hermann, including minimally invasive and endoscopic release, as well as full cranial vault remodeling surgery. And finally, at the end, we're going to open it up to you, our audience, to ask any questions that you may have about these conditions and the treatments that we offer. So let's get started. As you can see, children can present with many different patterns or shapes to their skulls. In the cases presented here, some of these patients will need surgery to correct their head shape, and some will need non-surgical therapy. Can you tell the difference? To a non-medical person or even a non-craniofacial trained provider, differentiating the causes for these head shape changes can be extremely difficult. While each of these heads presented is different in shape, an understanding of the anatomy and the forces acting on them will help clear up some of the confusion surrounding their diagnosis and care. Over the course of the webinar today, we hope to slightly demystify this process, but also inform you on the options available for each of these children. Before we begin, a basic understanding of the anatomy of the infant's skull is crucial. The skull is made up of seven bones, including the paired frontal bones, parietal bones, and the lateral temporal bones. In the back, there is a single occipital bone. Each of these bones is then joined together by sutures or open joints. These sutures allow the brain and skull to grow in size over the first few years of life of the infant. There is a metopic suture that lies in the forehead between the two frontal bones. The sagittal suture continues down the midline of the skull over the top or vertex of the head. The coronal suture runs from one ear to the other over the top of the head. And finally, the landoid suture lies in the back of the head between the parietal and the occipital bones. These sutures and the bones around them can deform or change in response to external pressure, most commonly during the birth process or with prolonged pressure on a single side of the head. Normally, these sutures remain open until later in life. However, as we'll discuss later, Craniosynostosis refers to a condition where these sutures fuse early in life, often before birth. 
These fused sutures can cause changes to the shape of the head as they restrict normal growth. We will discuss more on the specific types of craniosynostosis later in our presentation today. But let's first talk about the most common cause for abnormal head shape, that being posterior deformational plagiocephaly or benign positional plagiocephaly. Since the advent of the back to sleep campaign to reduce the occurrence of SIDS, which is also sudden in infant death syndrome, there's been a drastic reduction in infant mortality from sleeping on uh, infants from infants sleeping on their stomach. However, putting these children to sleep on their back puts pressure on the back of the head, and consequently, we've seen an increased number of children who present with a flat spot on the back of their heads. This flat spot is referred to as deformational or positional posterior plagiocephaly. Deformational plagiocephaly is an imposing word but it really means twisted head or abnormal head shape due to pressure being placed on a single spot for a prolonged time. As you can see from the pictures, when a child favors one side or the other for a long time, that portion of the head flattens out. The opposite side and even the forehead and face can bulge out as the brain and the skull are deformed into an abnormal head shape. The sutures that we mentioned before remain open but simply move in response to the forces they feel. And because the sutures remain open, there's no risk for increased pressure on the brain and no issues with the development of the brain as well. This shape, while often asymmetric as shown here, can also affect bilateral or both sides of the head. It's most commonly the result of a child preferring one side or the other or a congenital tightness of the neck muscles called torticollis. Some infants are born with severe deformational plagiocephaly simply from the pressure within the uterus. Many of these resolve after birth when the external forces are removed, but some require additional treatment. The treatment for deformational plagiocephaly does not involve surgery. Just as the forces can cause the shape of the head to change, Removing them can allow the brain and the head to return to a normal shape. For mild deformational changes, simply watching and waiting is all that is needed to happen for improvements to occur. Physical therapy is helpful in infants who have a side preference or a tightening of the neck or the torticollis, as we mentioned. Stretching of the neck or positioning toys or objects of interest on the side away from their side of preference can alleviate some of the pressure from the posterior portion of their head. For more severe cases, helmet therapy has emerged as a mainstay of treatment for deformational plagiocephaly. For these severe cases, we recommend helmet therapy. Helmets are custom fabricated devices which are based on laser Doppler scans of the infant's head and skull. They're worn all day and night and only removed for bathing purposes. Slowly, over three to six months, they apply gentle pressure to shape the infant's head back into a normal position. Here are some examples of children before and after helmet therapy. On the left, you can see how there's a flattening on the right posterior portion of the head and how it is resolved following the helmet therapy in the right image. And again, looking from the lateral view, it's easy to appreciate how the flatness seen on the left takes on a much more natural and rounded appearance on the right. Here's a second infant with a slightly more severe case of posterior deformational plagiocephaly, again with the flatness on the right, which showing that it's much improved after the course of therapy on the, on the right. And again, in the lateral view, we see that this posterior flatness adopts a more rounded and normal profile of a normal skull. Thank you, Dr. Greaves. This is Dr. Shaw. I'm going to talk a little bit now, uh, change topics to craniosynostosis. Um, craniosynostosis is the abnormal early fusion of cranial sutures. 
when this happens, there's an abnormal head shape. And the key to understanding all this is understanding the normal anatomy that Dr. Greaves was talking about earlier and how when there's an early fusion of the cranial suture, what happens is that growth is restricted perpendicular to that normal suture. And so each one of these different shapes are caused by a fusion of the different sutures. And when this happens, the brain growth that's normal can be restricted and there can be an increased pressure on the brain. And we're going to talk about each one of these shapes uh, separately. So first off, we have metopic craniosynostosis. And as the name implies, there's an early fusion of the metopic suture. The metopic suture, as we remember, is the one that is on the forehead. And this condition is also called trigonocephaly, or triangle-shaped head. And you can see here that when the metopic suture fuses abnormally, there's a big ridge in the forehead. You can see that from the top-down view, kind of forms a triangle here. And you can also see that from the straight front view. And then when we look at the CT scan, we can see that the metopic suture is fused too early. And here, the sagittal suture and the coronal sutures are not fused. When this condition happens, the eyes are closely spaced together and there's a ridge in the forehead. Next, we'll move on to sagittal craniosynostosis. As the name implies, this is an early fusion of the sagittal suture. This is the most common form of craniosynostosis for a single suture. This condition has many names as it's the most common form of craniosynostosis, but the most common ones are scaphocephaly or dolicocephaly, and these mean boat-shaped head. And the reason it's called that is because the, the head is long and narrow, much more so than normal. This is looking at it from top down, and this is looking at it from the side. And again, you see that it's very long, very narrow. And when we look at the CT scan, the sagittal suture here is abnormally fused, whereas the other sutures aren't. So what ends up happening is that the child has a bulging forehead and also a bulging back of the head. Next, we have unicoronal craniosynostosis, where one coronal suture is fused too soon. And what ends up happening is anterior plagiocephaly, or twisted head, in the front side. The eyebrows and the forehead have an unequal position when compared from side to side. And this often leads to the child tilting his or her head to level the gaze. This is also known as a harlequin eye deformity. It can be seen pretty easily here on the CT scan. We see a widened orbit uh, twisting of the head and this frontal bossing here. So what ends up happening then in the child's face is that there's an unequal position of the eyebrows and the forehead. And then in the top-down view, you see this abnormal fusion of the coronal suture and this twisting backwards of the head. When the coronal suture abnormally fuses on both sides, it's called bicoronal craniosynostosis, which is otherwise known as brachycephaly, short head. And this condition is most often associated with other syndromes. And is also, these children are high risk for elevations in brain pressure. And you can see why. These brains are abnormally short, or these heads, sorry, are abnormally short. When looked from the side, they're there's less uh, anterior-posterior distance here. When look from the top, again, um, they're, they're wider and they're, they're not long enough. And again, looking from the side view, uh, you can see this very characteristic picture of brachycephaly. Finally, we'll talk about lambdoid craniosynostosis. So remember the lambda suture, the lambdoid suture is the one that is in the back of the head. And when one of these sutures fuses, it's called posterior plagiocephaly or twisted head. Um, in true lambdoid craniosynostosis, 
the back part of the skull is flattened and the ear is rotated down and back and there's a very prominent mastoid suture and mastoid overall. So sometimes this can be difficult to differentiate from positional plagiocephaly. So in this slide, we'll look at the differences. As we were talking about before, the key to understanding craniosynostosis is that when the suture fuses too early, growth is restricted perpendicular to the suture. And so in positional plagiocephaly, which is that positional deformational plagiocephaly that Dr. Greaves was talking about, you can envision the head as being a square in which one side was shifted forward, kind of like a parallelogram. There's no restriction of growth. Um, the same side that has the flattened back of the head, the forehead is pushed forward and the ear is pushed forward, kind of like a parallelogram here. However, in lambdoid, in true lambdoid synostosis, where the lambdoid suture has fused too early, it's more of a trapezoid. And you can see this leg of the trapezoid is shorter than this leg, and that is again because growth has been restricted. And so here the ear is actually displaced posteriorly, and there's that prominence of the mastoid suture. And this is the quick way to tell the difference between positional plagiocephaly and lambdoid, true lambdoid synostosis by looking top down at the child. So now that we're all experts on craniosynostosis, why do we treat it? So it's not just the abnormal head shape that makes us want to treat craniosynostosis, although this is a good enough reason. The elevations and pressure on the brain that the child is at risk for can cause headaches. They can cause abnormal brain development, so disabilities in learning and developmental delay. And if the pressure gets high enough, they can even cause vision issues and even total blindness. What treatment options do we have for craniosynostosis? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the two major categories. Here at Children's Memorial Herman, we offer minimally invasive endoscopic release as well as the more traditional cranial vault remodeling. Both have their pros and cons. The, in the minimally invasive endoscopic release, we use an endoscope with two small incisions or one small incision, depending on which suture we have to remove. The correction is done at an early age, often at two to three months. And there's a commitment for the child to have post-operative helmeting therapy. In traditional cranial vault remodeling, larger, more invasive surgery is done, but all the correction is done at one time. And we can also correct very severe defects without having to commit to helmet therapy afterwards. This can be typically performed at any age, but we like to wait until they're at least six months, because as we'll see, one of the trade-offs of a traditional open surgery is that universally they require transfusion, as they tend to be slightly longer surgeries, take a few hours, and uh, due to the swelling and the blood loss, the hospitalization tends to be a few days. The endoscopic surgery tends, again, to be done in children for less than three months, usually two to three months. There's a very minimal blood loss. The surgery itself takes an hour, and usually we can let the child go home the next day, but they do require commitment to the post-procedure helmet therapy. So now we're gonna go and take a look at some pictures for a minimally invasive surgery. So immediately after the minimally invasive sagittal release, this is the pre-op, the long and the narrow head of scaphocephaly that we were talking about earlier, sagittal synostosis. And with these two small incisions and the endoscope, there's an immediate correction. That's a more normal head shape here. The, the posterior bulge is gone. The forehead bulge is already gone. It's already better. And here we have a, a bit of a delay now. We see the preoperative and the postoperative result. Again, there's a more normal uh, 
looking head shape postoperatively. And finally, looking from the side, again, postoperatively, you can see that the, the child's head is no longer as long and it has a much more restored uh, anterior posterior length. And finally, as we look from the top down um, in a delayed fashion, again, we, we have that correction that we saw immediately postoperatively uh, that persists, and we can see a, a restored uh, anterior posterior uh, ratio to uh, the, the bioparietal width. And so the helmeting therapy is very important to this overall procedure. Um, once the, this, the abnormal suture is removed, the helmet therapy affords uh, the persistence of correction after that release. Here we look at it from a top-down perspective. Here again from the side, we can see that the child's head continues to remain in this post-operative correction. So now that we've done, uh, we're done talking about the minimally invasive and endoscopic approach, we're going to talk a little bit about the larger traditional cranial vault remodeling that uh, we offer. So as we discussed, uh, older patients or patients who present with more complex deformities due to their craniosynostosis, uh, they're no longer really candidates for the minimally invasive or endoscopic approaches. For these patients, we offer a larger traditional cranial vault remodeling surgery. In this surgery, uh, we take the affected cranial bones and the cranial sutures, we cut them and then actually reshape each individual piece and then fixate them back into a normal position. So in contrast to the endoscopic approach where we release the sutures and allow the brain to grow, really in the traditional vault, we grow the brain ourselves surgically and fix it in place. What this does is it correct, creates a skull that's not only immediately corrected in shape, but it provides room for the brain to expand secondarily and grow without the effects of the elevated intracranial pressures that Dr. Shaw talked about earlier. With this technique, our trained team of neurosurgeons and plastic surgeons can correct deformities on any areas of the skull. In fact, depending on the type of craniosynostosis that a child has or the specific deformities that they have, uh, we sometimes operate on their foreheads, sometimes as shown here in the middle of their uh, skull or in the vertex, and sometimes in the back uh, side of their skull or the occiput. And it really depends on a patient-to-patient -patient basis what type of surgery or what type of cranial vault we would offer uh, depending on their uh, type of craniosynostosis. So while this all seems very technically difficult and a challenging operation, which it is, cranial vault remodeling remains a safe surgery in the hands of highly trained specialists. The important thing is Children's Memorial Hermann can provide not only the surgical expertise, to complete these cases and surgeries, but also the pediatric anesthesia, as well as the critical care providers necessary to ensure a safe and successful outcome for all of our patients. So here we have a post-operative case uh, representing a patient who underwent an open or traditional cranial vault remodeling process for, I'm sure you guessed, sagittal craniosynostosis. As you see on the patient on the left, or the pre-op fixture on the left. His forehead is very narrow, and he's got a uh, very elongated head shape. And in the post-surgery picture, his forehead has been widened, and some of the height is reduced as well. And again, on the lateral view, you can see this elongated head and this bossing of his forehead here has been improved postoperatively 
but overall the size of the skull has been uh, enlarged to allow for additional brain growth. So as we conclude this webinar today, we've hoped that you've learned a few things that will help you when you encounter these patients in your future. We want to stress the importance of having an evaluation for any patient with suspected craniosynostosis by a, craned, uh, a trained craniofacial surgeon. That could be a neurosurgeon or a plastic surgeon, but someone with the expertise to know the differences between deformational plagiocephaly and the many types of craniosynostosis that we enc uh, encountered today. We are happy to provide any consultations for your patients that show any signs of abnormal head shape and offer our advice as well. And something that we cannot stress enough is that early intervention is key. For children with deformational plagiocephaly, the sooner we can start them in physical therapy or repositioning helmeting, or sorry, repositioning exercises, the less they may actually need to start a helmet. And if they do have a severe enough deformity, the sooner we start them in that helmet, the better their overall outcome will be. For patients who have craniosynostosis, early intervention means they are a candidate for the minimally invasive endoscopic surgery that Dr. Shaw talked about, which can eliminate their need for a larger surgery to correct their skull deformities. Now again, not every patient, even if they present early, will be a candidate for minimally invasive surgery, but for many, uh, that at least allows them the option and gives you the choice uh, of choosing your type of surgery that you would like. So we'd like to thank you for joining us today. We hope you learned uh, a little bit about both deformational plagiocephaly as well as craniosynostosis. Um, and we wanted to give you the information for the cleft and craniofacial clinic here at the University of Texas Health Sciences Center at Houston and Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital. We look forward to working with you in the future. So now that we're done, uh, we're going to look at some questions uh, that you, got, you are submitting here online for us. So our first question today is, uh, is plagiocephaly just cosmetic? Now, I think the important thing to understand is plagiocephaly means twisted head. So you can have deformational plagiocephaly, which is a uh, abnormal head shape from pressure. And you can also have posterior plagiocephaly, which is lambdoid craniosynostosis. So it really depends on the underlying diagnosis. Uh, obviously, craniosynostosis, that is plagiocephaly, so posterior plagiocephaly or anterior plagiocephaly with craniosynostosis is not cosmetic. That's actually a disease and a condition that needs to be surgically treated. For deformational plagiocephaly, yes, there is a cosmetic component to it in the fact that the head is abnormally shaped. However, there can be a functional component of this as well. Uh, children have difficulty wearing bicycle helmets. They can be teased at school. Uh, very severe cases of deformational plagiocephaly can actually affect not only just the skull, but the front of the face. So the orbits, uh, the mid face. Um, we have patients we've seen that have problems with their occlusion or their way their uh, teeth fit together because of the pressure on the back of the head. So. It really is a spectrum, um, but thinking of plagiocephaly itself as uh, an umbrella term for any kind of abnormal head shape um, is is correct. But it really needs we really need to understand the underlying uh, diagnosis uh, before we can come up with a treatment plan. Just Dr. Shaw, it's a great question here. Um, uh, if you have a child with an abnormal head shape. Um, would you would we recommend referral for a consultation or getting some kind of initial imaging study like a skull uh, a skull film or a CT? You know, one of the great things we can do sometimes is obviate the need for a, C, a CT scan or any kind of imaging at all. So we'd be very happy to just see the patient and see the child and determine if if anything's needed. Usually, the skull the skull X rays aren't very terribly helpful. 
and uh, sometimes no no imaging is needed at all, and so we can we can avoid getting a CT scan altogether. But we're always very happy to see the patient um, in a timely fashion and figure that out. Thanks. Uh, we have another really interesting question. Um, what are our thoughts on helmet treatment for non-surgical treatment from metopic fusion? And what would our criteria be to do surgery on metopic suture? So this is actually a very controversial uh, topic, and a lot of craniofacial surgeons discuss their criteria on metopic craniosynostosis. The metopic, the metopic suture is the only suture in the skull that normally fuses in infancy. And normally we see this fusing somewhere between six months and a year. Now, there are some children who have that fusion occurring earlier, or even after it occurs at a year, they form a ridge in their forehead. Now, while it's technically metopic craniosynostosis, there is a separate category of, of children that we refer to have as having metopic ridge syndrome, which means they just have a ridge where their metopic suture used to be. This is largely a cosmetic deformity. Um, and if it's just a ridge in the forehead, uh, many times we can watch these children uh, over the few, first few years of their life. And as long as they have no signs or symptoms of having elevated intracranial pressure, um, we can, a lot of them will grow out of this ridge. Um, I, I don't know of any use of helmet therapy for metopic, uh, craniosynostosis or metopic ridge syndrome. Um, and as far as our criteria for surgery on metopic craniosynostosis, obviously if there's any signs of elevated intracranial pressure, that's an easy one. We know we need to do surgery to re reduce the pressure on the brain, reduce the pressure pressure on the eyes, and help the, allow the brain to grow. The other indications for surgery from atopic craniosynostosis, in my mind, are uh, the severity of the head shape. So if they have a very, very prominent triangle, triangle-shaped head, um, and if their eyes are very closely uh, space together. So the metopic suture will draw the two eyes together so they actually have something called hypotelarism, where their eyes are too close together. And this can cause vision problems as well as be uh, cosmetically deforming um, both of the forehead and the eyes. For the patients that we see that have a severe case of metopic craniosynostosis, even in the absence of intracranial pressure elevations, we still recommend surgery. We have another question about uh, what can be done for a child that has a skull deformity and hasn't been treated and is now older, say five or six years old. We see uh, patients refer to the uh, Texas Cleft and Craniofacial Clinic all the time, uh, not necessarily in infancy, but of all ages. Um, sometimes uh, these skull abnormalities have gone unnoticed for years. Um, other times ophthalmologists or other practitioners have noticed headaches or they've seen signs of intracranial pressure, uh, especially on a uh, dilated uh, eye exam at their regular eye doctor. There's something wrong with the nerve in the back of the eye, which is one of the uh, signs and symptoms of elevated brain pressure. So we see kids of all ages uh, being referred in for these issues. Uh, craniosynostosis surgery, or the open vault surgery, can be performed at any age. Uh, as Dr. Shaw discussed, the endoscopic surgery is reserved for children really two to four months of age, um, and that's really because the bones are thinner and more malleable, and the brain um, is it's easier for the brain to grow with the thinner, uh, thinner bones and just the bone cuts. But we do do the open cranial uh, vault surgery on children of any age um, to allow more space for the brain to grow and alleviate the signs and symptoms of uh, elevated intracranial pressure. Hi, Dr. Shaw again. Uh, a couple of good questions here that go together. Uh, what I think we just answered that what is the youngest patient you can operate on? I think depending on what uh, the ideal surgery is, uh, again, there's a, there's a limited time window for the minimally invasive surgery, and that's really two, three, two to four months. And it's because the bone needs to be thin enough for us to be able to cut with the small instruments that we have um, and to be malleable enough uh, to 
work with postoperative helmeting therapy, um, but the total total vault remodeling can be done at any age. Um, and the recovery time for both procedures is uh, is is variable in the procedure. So the minimally invasive recovery time, uh, the child will leave the hospital typically the next day, uh, will be pretty much back to normal uh, that that night or the next day, and um, the wound all wounds take about. Three, three to four weeks to heal, uh, and, and after that, you know, the recovery is pretty much dictated by the patient. Um, for the total vault remodeling, they typically tend to spend about four to five days in the hospital, and then after that, similar kind of time course, it takes about three to four weeks for the wound to heal. So we have a question uh, regarding uh, the children with deformational plagiocephaly. And uh, I, when I was discussing physical therapy and some of the non-surgical or non-helmeting interventions, talked about watching and waiting. One of the things that we see with children who are born and have early signs of deformation, and this can be within the first month or two of life, is if we intervene early and start physical therapy or start repositioning exercises to, to prevent or stop the deformation from occurring, sometimes the child's head is allowed to expand and grow. Um, this is this needs to be kind of managed against the fact that if we want to start helmet therapy or we think that a helmet should be started, this needs to be started, you know, before before one year of age, ideally around six months of age. One of the things we wait for, um, you know, we don't start a helmet on a child who's a week old is because the helmet actually is heavy and uh, the child needs to be able to support the weight of their head and support the weight of the head with the helmet on. Um, to make sure that it's safe to be wearing a helmet. So in the interim, while we're waiting to start the helmet therapy, for very early and very young children, doing things like repositioning exercises, physical therapy, um, uh, stretching, and repositioning the child off of the side of deformation can allow some of those changes to improve. Um, however, if your child is six months old or 10 months old, you're soon, you're soon moving out of the window of time that we can actually treat them with a helmet, uh, and they should probably be evaluated earlier rather than later. And again, early intervention is key for all of these children. So the sooner we see them, these patients, the sooner we can uh, help them get involved in physical therapy, help them in a helmet, or refer them to surgery depending on what they need. We actually have two questions that are kind of similar, um, both having to do with the number of surgeries that children with craniosynostosis need or any need, uh, whether there's a concern for refusion of these sutures after um, we open them up. Uh, for the majority of children who have craniosynostosis, and this applies for minimally invasive endoscopic surgeries or open cranial vault surgeries, if it's a single suture, just one of those sutures is fused, often they get by with a single surgery. We can release the suture, the brain is allowed to grow, and new bone is formed over the entire, cal uh, the entire skull, and um, it grows with the patient. For the larger cranial vault surgeries, we make the brain as big as we can, or sorry, the skull as big as we can, and that's usually good enough for um, future growth of the, of the um, patient. For patients who have more than one suture, and we didn't really get into that because they're actually rather rare. Um, we see them often here in the center, but in the community, they're rare. So if you have more than one suture, such as both coronal sutures, bicoronal craniosynostosis, or a combination of two different sutures, those patients generally need more than one surgery. Um, there also are cases uh, where Children have genetic diseases um, such as Pfeiffer syndrome or Cruzon's or Apert syndrome where their cranial sutures fuse early in life and they have abnormalities in bone growth and bone formation. Those children often need multiple surgeries, um, not only of their skull, but also of their mid-face, their teeth, their jaws. Um, but for the purposes of the majority of patients with craniosynostosis, again, a single suture, uh, which is what we see the most of, one surgery will correct this deformity, um, at least from a bony standpoint. Another great question here. So aside from Dr. Greaves and Dr. Shah, who's going to be taking care of your child when you come here for craniofacial 
evaluation and surgery. We have a really wonderful team here at the Clough Craniofacial Clinic. Um, we have a wonderful speech language pathology staff, um, nurse coordinators that will take care of your child and coordinate all the care that's needed. Um, uh, feeding specialists, child life specialists, um, ear, nose, and throat surgeons, as other things are needed. Um, really great staff here that you will interact with. Uh, we actually have a question now um, regarding helmet therapy and outcomes. Um, as many of you probably have seen, there was an article that was actually picked up uh, by some of the major uh, newspapers in the country regarding outcomes with helmet therapy um, and suggesting that helmet therapy actually doesn't improve um, head shape uh, when looked at um, kind of scientifically. Um, this study has uh, caused a lot of uh, drama and discussion in the world of crani uh, craniofacial surgery, uh, as well as um, with many of these uh, uh, helmet uh, companies. Um, one of the one of the things when looking at that study in particular, which is the BMJ study, um, is that not all children's children got the same intervention. Not all children were started with the helmet therapy early enough. And as you can imagine, with any surgery, with any uh, intervention, not every um, every type of surgery is the same, and not every type of helmet therapy is the same. Um, one of the things that we recommend um, is being evaluated by a trained craniofacial team. Um, not every patient that I see with a flat spot on the back of their head do I recommend for a helmet. Um, and that's really part of my looking at the severity of their deformity, um, how well they're responding to any physical therapy they're doing, and um, also their age. Um, so for the right patient in the right at the right age with you know a moderate or a severe level of deformity, uh, helmet therapy in our hands here at the Texas Cleft and Craniofacial Clinic has been shown to significantly improve the head shape of our patients. Um, that being said, we work with a helmet uh, company that we trust and that uh, has been uh, has done very good um, work with our patients. Um, and that is just something to keep in mind uh, if you're referring patients to an, uh, a helmet company is that uh, they're vetted and that they have um, good results and good outcomes. Um, so just like you're looking for a surgeon uh, who can do an, a, an excellent job for the, the craniosynostosis surgery, um, you should also be looking for a helmet company that provides good uh, and solid re results for all the patients with uh, deformational plagiocephaly. Well, this about ends our webinar today. Um, we hope that all of you who tuned in today and are hearing this in the future uh, have learned a bit about uh, deformational plagiocephaly and its treatments, as well as craniosynostosis and the multiple uh, surgical options that uh, Dr. Shaw and myself, Dr. Greaves, offer here at Children's Memorial Herman Hospital and through the Texas Cleft and Craniofacial Clinic. Our phone number for the clinic, as you can see on the screen, is 832 325 7234. And we look forward to working with you in the future and seeing any of the consults that come our way. We're always open for questions and comments. And thank you very much for tuning in to us and our webinar today.